Hello, my name is Dr. Stan Martin, and I am the Director of Infectious Diseases for Geidinger. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the clinical manifestations and management of infection due to SARS-CoV-2. Coronaviruses have been around for some time. We've actually known that coronaviruses can infect humans since at least the 1960s. Um, and we have seen that they can infect other animals as well. For the longest time, we thought they were fairly benign, though, causing nothing more than a simple common cold. But we knew they had this kind of interesting structure that when you looked at them under an electron microscope, they seemed to have this halo of strange glycoprotein spikes, giving them this appearance of the corona of the sun, and hence uh, the name coronaviruses. But these little spikes uh, actually serve the virus uh, well. They help with the infectious process itself because these are the surface proteins which attach to the cell receptors in the respiratory epithelia. In particular with SARS-CoV-2, it is this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor or ACE receptor that is found on the cell surface. This is very similar to the original SARS coronavirus actually back in 2003. And after the virus, of course, infects the cell, its genome, which is essentially a single strand of positive sense RNA, gets replicated and translated into proteins for more capsules, and of course, replicating the genome further, which creates more viruses which are then released by the cell to go infect other cells. This whole process can be fairly cytopathic and kind of cause destruction of the respiratory epithelia. Hence, all the symptoms that we see with, with infection, including, of course, pneumonia. Genetically, this virus is very similar to the original SARS coronavirus. And we can see in this uh, kind of outline of the genetic relatedness of different coronaviruses that we're aware of that can infect both humans and various animals, mostly mammals, but occasionally birds. We can see a number of ones that kind of stand out like the human coronavirus HKU1, human coronavirus OC43. These we've known about for some time. And these tend to cause nothing more than the human common cold, right? The sniffles. Uh, but we know, of course, that some others can infect humans and cause more severe disease. Good example there might be MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome-related coronavirus. And of course, the original SARS coronavirus, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which had the breakout from China back in 2003. This current coronavirus is very similar. And if you can see through this map that the genetic relatedness is fairly close. And this is why it's been given the name or designation coronavirus 2. And you can see that there are others that are even similar that are known to infect bats, but not necessarily humans. Um, and uh, bats seem to be the biggest source of coronaviruses. Uh, and it's probably other animals that serve as intermediaries for example, with MERS, it's clearly camels. Uh, and then from camels, it can infect humans. With the original SARS coronavirus, it was thought that there were some other potential mammals involved, like civet or other uh, animals uh, unique to uh, China. With SARS coronavirus 2, we're not exactly sure. Uh, but we do know that it certainly can infect other mammals, uh, including house pets, like your cat or even your dog. The spread of the virus is from person to person, mainly through respiratory droplets. And we use this term droplet to describe kind of larger sized respiratory secretions that are exuded from the mouth or the nose when a person is coughing, sneezing, or even just talking. And these droplets tend to be uh, sizable enough that they drop around the person with the infection just by gravity usually within six feet. You usually do not see these droplets extend beyond six feet. Really smaller infectious droplet nuclei, uh, which are known to be associated with other infections like tuberculosis, for example, or other viruses like measles is an example, uh, 
can travel much, much farther. And infectious spread uh, can be much more difficult to contain with those kinds of infections. And we don't see that happen very often or to any high degree with SARS coronavirus, which is fortunate because of course these droplets are what cause infection to spread. If they touch the mucous membranes of another person, whether that's the mouth, the nose, or even the eyes can serve as uh, a place uh, of egress for the, for the virus. Um, sometimes droplets can land on surfaces and persist for an extended period of time. And then of course the person can come along and touch that surface and now they're touching their face and voila, they have an infection now as well. But most of the infectious spread is through direct contact with these droplets in the atmosphere. After exposure, symptoms will typically develop within about a two to 12 day period. On average, if you look at large scale studies uh, like have been done in China, the median incubation period is about four days, meaning if you come in contact with somebody with infection due to SARS-CoV-2, if you're gonna get the infection and become sick, it's usually around the day four or five mark. Now, some people, of course, it can be longer, and this is why you hear us sometimes talk about the 14-day quarantine period, right? Because we know that if you've gone 14 days after an exposure with no symptoms, then the odds that you're gonna develop symptoms at that point are virtually nil. Uh, most people will have developed symptoms, certainly within that 12-day window. And what kind of symptoms are we talking about? Well, mostly, of course, we're talking about pneumonia. That is the most frequent, serious manifestation of infection. But more commonly, we see more of what we call the upper respiratory tract symptoms, right? Uh, this can be kind of congestion, cough. Um, we see body aches fevers, we see some degree of diarrhea, and loss of smell or taste is something that's interestingly specific uh, with SARS-CoV-2, although not that common. Most people don't actually have that. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that if you come to my office or any other doctor's office and you say, hey, doc, you know, I, I feel really run down, I think I've got a low-grade fever, I've got a little bit of a cough, a little congestion, there is no way that that uh, physician can tell whether or not you have COVID versus say some other respiratory viral infection like influenza or adenovirus or even just a simple rhinovirus which causes a common cold, right? Uh, that's where testing comes into it and becomes very um, necessary, uh, particularly for this season. If you look at uh, large scale studies uh, of uh, patients and symptoms, we can see that the CDC reported when they reviewed over 370,000 cases that although fever is one of the more commonly reported symptoms from patients, you know, about 69, 70% of the time, actually when people are really sick and coming into the hospital, uh, only about a fifth or maybe a third of them actually have fever at that time, interestingly enough. At that point, and I'm going to show you this a little bit later in another slide, but at that point, the fevers typically have subsided. Uh, and as I mentioned, of course, the altered smell and taste uh, is something which has been uh, reported. It's very difficult to study altered smell or taste because it's very subjective, of course. Uh, and you can see, though, in this report, really less than 10% of patients actually reported any kind of change in smell or taste, even though this may be a very specific marker, but certainly cannot be relied on when it's uh, this uncommon. But you can see most of these other symptoms, again, fairly nonspecific, right? Cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, which is, just means muscle aches, right? Runny nose, sore throat, headaches, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea quite nonspecific uh, in trying to figure out what might be going on uh, with patients with this infection. If you do laboratory tests on patients, uh, and of course we do when they come into the hospital with this infection, we see a few things uh, which tend to be uh, consistent, although again, fairly nonspecific, right? So lymphopenia, uh, 
low levels of lymphocytes in the blood uh, is probably one of the most common findings we see in the laboratory. But again, nonspecific. You can see that with other viral infections and other bacterial infections even. Elevated markers like lactate dehydrogenase, other inflammatory markers like ferritin, C-reactive protein, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. These are fairly, again, nonspecific markers of inflammation that can happen in the body and can happen for any number of reasons. And again, so not specific to COVID, unfortunately. One thing that can certainly happen with COVID and we've learned a lot about in recent months is the abnormalities that can happen with coagulation. Um, and this can be problematic for patients because there does seem to be a potential increased risk for uh, thrombotic events in these patients. And what I mean by that are blood clots that form uh, causing subsequent problems like deep venous thromboses, uh, myocardial infarctions, pulmonary emboli, or strokes um, can uh, be uh, a little bit more common in this patient population. And sometimes we even give these patients anticoagulation depending on what their blood tests are showing and other um, signs of how ill they may be in the hospital. Procalcitonin is a blood test which we occasionally use to try to help distinguish between bacterial or non-bacterial infections. And as you can imagine, it tends to be normal, uh, which we see again with most viral infections um, in patients, regardless of the virus. Uh, if you look at the imaging studies, like a chest CT scan, the findings can be fairly nonspecific uh, and uh, all over the place. Um, so hard to hang your hat on any just one finding when you look at uh, radiography. And this is just kind of a, a sample of patchy bilateral kind of ground glass infiltrates that you can see in the lungs of a patient with fairly mild to moderate infection. In more severe disease, of course, the patchiness will become more pronounced and more extensive throughout the lung fields. The clinical course, uh, as to people who have maybe, say, mild infection or maybe even no symptoms or much more severe disease, uh, can be a little difficult to study. Definite statistics here are challenging because we are limited by testing, right? Uh, if you look at some of the data that was initially reported by China uh, when they were first seeing this infection, uh, they were reporting something like a mortality rate of close to 10%. But of course, the only people that were getting tested for it were people who were winding up in the ICU with very severe illness in the first place, right? So the population of patients was very small. We've since extended testing to much larger amounts of population and given us a better sense of the degree of mild versus moderate versus severe infection. But there's still a lot of testing that we have not been able to accomplish due to limitations and resources. And this is not just in the United States, but worldwide a challenge. But we do know that asymptomatic infection can occur. Some estimates may be even as high as 30 to 40% of all infections could be asymptomatic. We don't know that for sure, but uh, that is an estimate. Uh, based on some surveillance studies that have been done where swabs have been taken from asymptomatic people over large groups to see who may have the virus. But of course, we don't have longitudinal, com longitudinal confirmation in a lot of these studies. In other words, these subsequent patients weren't followed to see if they go on to develop disease. And it probably depends on the population as a whole. Uh, and even when patients are asymptomatic and they tell you they feel fine, if you actually put them through a CT scanner, a lot of times you can actually see some small patchy areas in their lungs suggesting uh, that there may be something going on even if the patient isn't even aware of it. Mild to moderate infections, these are patients who are sick, they clearly have symptoms, but they're not necessarily sick enough to come into the hospital. Um, uh, they oftentimes can just be treated at home uh, or stay out of the hospital. Uh, and this does seem to be the vast majority uh, once the CDC uh, from China uh, did uh, give a final report of some of their data, they knew about 40,000 infections at that point. And the majority were certainly in that mild to moderate category, roughly about 
That same study looked at severe infections. These are patients who wind up in the hospital who do need oxygen as a, as a result of being short of breath, was closer to about 14%. And those who were very sick requiring a stay in the intensive care unit, maybe even requiring intubation, mechanical ventilation, all sorts of other measures was about 5%. And again, the mortality rates we now have a better sense of but we still don't know exactly, right? Because of the problems with testing and asymptomatic cases. But for the most part, the estimates seem to be in the 0.5 to 2%. And it's probably closer to 0.5 than it is to 2%. However, not everybody, uh, not everybody's risk of death or complications from this infection is the same, right? If you study healthy 20-year-olds with this infection, you're gonna find much different outcomes than if you study 80-year-old nursing home patients. Uh, the latter, of course, do much more poorly. And we have seen some things really stand out to us when it comes to the risk of having severe disease or even death from this infection. Age is probably the biggest one. 80% of deaths have occurred in individuals age 65 or older. Um, with this infection. And this isn't unique to the United States. This is seen elsewhere as well. Fortunately, children seem to be relatively spared. Although they can experience severe infection, uh, you see that to maybe less than 2% of kids. Um, and they can have some very strange phenomena happen. You may have heard of these kind of multi-system inflammatory syndrome phenomena that can happen in children. Uh, Fortunately, death is quite exceptional in children uh, with this infection. But we can see that regardless of age, other factors stand out. If you have heart problems, if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease, obesity, or if you are a smoker, you are again, much more likely to suffer severe disease or death as a result of this infection, regardless of your age. And of these, what is most interesting that has come to stand out um, and really be a red flag is obesity. Uh, we have an obesity epidemic in the United States, as you guys are aware, and uh, it is certainly a problem with COVID. It seems to be uh, one of the major risk factors for having severe problems with this infection. Socioeconomic status is also an issue. Uh, and we have seen that the outcomes uh, in different ethnic groups in the United States and in some other countries like the United Kingdom uh, can be quite disparate. Black, Hispanic, South Asian individuals seem to comprise a highly disproportional amount of infections and deaths due to COVID. Um, and when you try to suss this out, it can be difficult. Uh, why is that? Uh, but if you control for things like comorbidities, socioeconomic factors, some of these uh, disparities or differences uh, can go away, suggesting that it really is um, more of a socioeconomic problem in certain ethnic groups in some of these countries that, uh, that can uh, promote a bad outcome, right? If you don't have access to health care, if you don't have resources to be healthy in the first place, you're gonna be much more likely to have these comorbidities. You're gonna be much more likely to not be able to control the infection or to get the care that you might need until too late. As I alluded to earlier, there is a somewhat of a timeline of infection that can happen. Uh, if you go back here, prior to symptom onset, we said that exposure uh, will typically lead to symptom onset around day four. Uh, but for some people, it may be out as long as 14 days. After that, you get uh, fevers, myalgias, uh, the symptoms that we've talked about. Uh, and some of those can wax and wane, and some of them even improve. But the shortness of breath, the development of inflammation in the lungs, and the pneumonitis that we see will eventually sometimes result in the hospital admission, usually about a week later. And that's fairly predictable. The patient uh, does fine at home for the first week, and then they start to get very sick, wind up in the hospital, and then if they're going to go on to develop 
more severe problems with their breathing, that's going to happen within about another three uh, days. And if they're going to die from the infection, that's going to happen again, maybe another week after that. Um, and so when you see or you hear about a really large spike in the number of new cases, be mindful of the fact that what that, what that means is about a week later, there's going to be a spike in hospitalizations. And then a week after that, you're going to see a spike in deaths. Um, and so uh, it is a rolling uh, phenomena. The complications from the infection, of course, uh, include the respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. That is the most common and most severe complication, uh, which results in respiratory failure and death in most patients. But things like heart failure, inflammation in the heart, and arrhythmias uh, can be seen. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the thromboembolic complications because of uh, the development of blood clots uh, that can happen in some patients. There are other kind of strange <clears throat> inflammatory complications that are due to cytokine release from this infection, the cytokine release syndrome, uh, where patients seem uh, almost like they're in septic shock as a result of the infection. We can see some uh, immune-related phenomena, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a, an immune-mediated um, uh, kind of paralytic process that can happen. We've actually even seen that here at Geisinger. Uh, and the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which uh, is more common in children, are uh, teenagers and even some young adults. And we have also seen this at Geisinger. Secondary infections, thankfully, tend to be uncommon, though they do occur. This is where somebody uh, may have the viral respiratory infection. Uh, and then a week after that or so, develop a bacterial pneumonia as a consequence. Uh, that's something that we see with some other viral syndromes, particularly influenza uh, can be one of those, but uh, does not seem to be as common uh, with COVID. Recovery and long-term sequela uh, uh, is something that we're also now just starting to get a handle on because recovery can take weeks, even in mild infection, fatigue, ongoing shortness of breath, joint pains, problems with cognition. Sometimes people will describe cloudy thinking and just feeling a little out of it, so to speak. Um, for outpatients, even who just have a mild uh, infection, uh, maybe only 65% of them will feel back to baseline after three weeks, uh, meaning even close to a month afterwards, they still don't feel like they're quite back to normal. They may feel better, but they still don't feel quite back to normal. For those who got really sick, the critically ill patients, uh, a minority uh, will feel back to baseline after a couple months. So there is definitely a very long process of getting back to normal after being critically ill. And the term long haulers uh, is sometimes bandied about, and you may hear about that uh, in the literature or in reports. So how do we diagnose infection? Well, uh, we said that uh, after exposure, uh, we see symptom onset certainly within about two weeks. Uh, and during that time period, you can test patients. So in other words, you can come to a testing center and you can say, oh my gosh, you know, my friend Gary, it's always Gary's fault, right? Gary had COVID and I was around Gary. Uh, what do I do? What do I do? Well, I can test you if you want, but odds are it's going to be negative. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be fine, right? It doesn't tell me that you're not going to go on to develop COVID. And so you have to recognize that there are some limitations. But viral shedding does start to peak generally within about two days prior to symptom onset. And you can sometimes pick up the virus at that time with PCR tests. And then viral shedding peaks, certainly within that first week of the illness. And then after that, tends to drop quite dramatically. However, in some patients, the viral shedding that can be detected by PCR can go on for weeks and even months after the illness. And so there are some patients who you may see a month later and they say, you know, I'm feeling much better, I'm fine, I don't have any cough anymore, I'm really feeling much better, but you could swab them and you can still detect the virus. But that does not necessarily mean they are infectious at that point because the viral shedding that typically occurs beyond a couple weeks no longer represents 
viable contagious virus. It's essentially just fragments of virus that are being picked up by the PCR um, and uh, are safe for that person uh, to be around. And so we rely primarily on two tests, at least at this time, to diagnose COVID, PCR testing uh, and antibody testing. There is also antigen-based testing, but I'm not gonna really talk about that right now because we don't really have any significant FDA-approved tests for antigen, uh, although there will be some coming down the pike, I'm sure. Um, and, and we also have to recognize that the antigen tests are, are just a little bit more limited uh, in their, their sensitivity. But the PCR test tends to be very sensitive. And within the first couple weeks of the illness, uh, the PCR is most certainly likely to be positive when you're taking it from a swab from the nasopharynx or the oropharynx, or even if you're taking it from sputum or from samples down deep in the lungs, uh, you can usually detect the virus during this time period. And then again, as I mentioned, over time, you can no longer detect the genetic material from the virus uh, after uh, several weeks, sometimes months. Um, the antibody test uh, has some limitations as well. During early on in the course of the infection, the patient may not have detectable antibodies. And so when the patients come to clinic or the hospital and they feel sick, you can't rely on an antibody test to tell you that they have COVID. But once they get better after a couple of weeks, yeah, then the antibodies tend to kick in from the immune response from the patient. And at that point, you can usually pick them up uh, certainly by about 14 days after symptom onset, most of the antibody tests will start to pick up uh, these antibodies. But they don't tell you, uh, again, whether the patient has active infection or symptoms, and the antibodies can persist for months. We know that, although they do tend to wane over time. And this is what happens with other coronaviruses, and this is why immunity from the long-term perspective may be a bit of a problem. If you wanna look at some of our own data here at Geisinger, uh, when I pulled this from our dashboard on November 5th, you can see that at that point in time, we have done over 180,000 COVID PCR tests to date in our laboratory uh, with an overall test positivity rate uh, of about 7.7%. This has since gone up uh, even just in the time uh, of the past uh, week or two, uh, the, the positivity rate is now much higher as the numbers of infection in our community are starting to peak considerably. Um, and if you look at our antibody testing, you can see again, data pulled from November 5th, we've done uh, over four and a half thousand antibody tests um, and the positivity rate again, around 7% at this time. Uh, a lot of limitations, as I mentioned, in what the antibody tests can tell us. Um, and we're not using it primarily to diagnose active acute infections, but I would anticipate that over time, we'll see the percentages go up with this test as well. So how do we actually treat this infection? Well, there are many avenues of treatment and I'm gonna highlight a few of them, okay? dexamethasone and glucocorticoids, antiviral treatments like remdesivir, convalescent plasma and monoclonal antibodies. These are using antibodies to try to prevent the spread of infection within the patient. Uh, and as of uh, the recording of this uh, lecture, the FDA has just given an emergency use authorization for uh, a, a monoclonal antibody to treat COVID. This is the first one this has happened, uh, an antibody manufactured by Eli Lilly, which is you really only useful for patients who have mild to moderate infection. These are patients who do not need to be in the hospital. These are patients who are early on in the infection uh, where the antibody seems to be most helpful. Other drugs that have been tried, uh, including trying to treat the cytokine storms like interleukin-6 pathway inhibitors, Unfortunately, these drugs have not really panned out to be much beneficial. Anticoagulation and the role it may play in preventing blood clots. There's still a lot of study going on in this arena, and I'm not sure we know a lot of the right answers just yet as the time of, of the recording here. And of course, respiratory support. We've learned a lot about how best to oxygenate these patients and to keep their blood oxygen levels where they need to be based on positioning, uh, 
and use of mechanical ventilation in the intensive care units. I'm going to highlight a couple of these drugs, though, because I think it's worth mentioning them. The first is dexamethasone. So dexamethasone is a steroid. It's a glucocorticoid. And it's worth highlighting because to date, it is really the only drug which has been shown in a prospective clinical trial to have any benefit to mortality, meaning it can decrease your risk of death if you get this drug. Now, this was based on a clinical trial in the United Kingdom of over 6,000 patients. Uh, and it was uh, a, a large study where they used a lot of different medications. Uh, but dexamethasone was the only one of those panned out to show any benefit to mortality. It, but you can see when you look at the graph over here on the right that the difference is fairly small, right? It's not like you get dexamethasone and your risk of death drops to zero. Uh, it is pretty small compared to just kind of normal, usual care. But it is statistically significant. Uh, and it only does seem to help patients who need supplemental oxygen, right? So. If you're short of breath enough to actually need oxygen, then dexamethasone may be a benefit. If not, if you have a more mild infection and you're not having to come into the hospital, your doctor's not necessarily going to prescribe you dexamethasone because in those cases, it does not necessarily seem to provide any benefit. And other studies have come down the pike since then, uh, smaller scale studies and even a meta-analysis, which have kind of supported the outcome of this large study. Uh, from the recovery trial in the United Kingdom. And so I think this is worth highlighting. I also want to highlight the drug remdesivir because this is currently the only FDA approved drug in the United States, which is a direct antiviral, right? So this is a drug which is designed to inhibit the replication of the virus itself. It is essentially a nucleoside analog or nucleotide analog, which is taken up by the replication machinery of the, of the virus once it's infected the cell and stops uh, the replication of the RNA genome, uh, stopping the virus in its tracks, right? Uh, the benefits of this drug are also fairly modest. Uh, it has not shown to necessarily be of benefit to mortality, meaning it does not decrease the risk of death in patients who get this drug, uh, but it can help improve recovery time and prevent complications, at least again, in patients who do require oxygen supplementation in the hospital, right? So again, these are only for patients who are sick enough to be admitted to the hospital as this drug shown to be of any benefit. And you might say, well, why is that? Why is that, Dr. Mar? I mean, this drug literally stops the virus. Why isn't this the cure uh, for treating this infection? And the problem is, is because, remember that timeline of infection I showed you, right? So by the time the patient's gotten to the point to where they're in the hospital requiring oxygen and they're getting this drug, the cat is kind of out, already out of the bag at that point, right? The virus has already set itself in. It's really caused problems with the body at that point. And although you may be stymieing it and you may help prevent complication, you're not necessarily solving the long-term problems uh, with some of these patients with this drug. So there's some limitations there. Now, there are other antivirals that are in development, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some approvals for some of these drugs as well, and hopefully they will pan out, and we'll see ultimately what these can show. The other real big limitation with remdesivir right now is that it's only available as an intravenous medication, so you have to get it through an IV. It's not like uh, I can just give you a pill and send you home with this drug. Really, of course, the best therapy is prevention, right? Your grandma was right. Uh, at the end of the day, if you can prevent the problem, uh, that's going to be the most uh, effective medicine. And we know that prevention uh, uh, really kind of revolves around two things, uh, masking and social distancing. Those seem to be the two biggest factors to prevent the spread of the infection in the community or in the healthcare setting. And wearing a mask is critical. Uh, a lot of modeling studies have shown that mask wearing in the general public can reduce transmission, even when masks are only moderately effective uh, at containing respiratory secretions. Obviously, some masks are better than others. And in the hospital, when we're taking care of COVID patients, we use very specific masks, like what we call N95 masks that are tight fitting uh, to help prevent transmission of infection in the hospital. Uh, but 
you know, if you're walking down the aisle in the grocery store, if you're just wearing a cloth mask, that can be perfectly effective in that uh, setting. It all depends on where you are and what you're doing, right? Uh, and if you're wearing the mask, uh, you are helping prevent the spread of infection to somebody else, and you are also helping to prevent yourself from getting the infection. Also critical to preventing the spread of infection are travel restrictions and what we call contact tracing and quarantining, right? In other words, uh, once Gary gets diagnosed with COVID, uh, somebody's got to figure out who, who Gary's been around over the last 48 hours to figure out who may come down with COVID. And somebody's got to be in contact with those people to tell them, hey, you were around Gary, you could have COVID or be getting COVID, so quarantine yourself, right? Go home, quarantine yourself. If you get symptoms, come in, get tested. Uh, that's the kind of process of contact tracing, and that can be highly beneficial at preventing spread. But of course, relies on people to be responsible uh, uh, for trying to prevent spread of infection in our communities. Overall, outcomes have definitely improved uh, with uh, treatment of this virus because we've gotten a lot better uh, at treating this virus, but also because we have a much better denominator now in terms of who has the infection, and we know uh, that there's a lot more mild to moderate infection out there and a lot more infection in younger, healthier folks as well. Uh, but we're still struggling. We're still not where we want to be. When you look at the infectious or mortality rates in the United States, uh, and certainly uh, we see that it's still higher uh, than we want it to be, certainly higher than some countries even, like South Korea and New Zealand. Uh, and again, a lot of that probably has to do with environmental and host factors of patients who are actually getting the infection, as I alluded to earlier, the social determinants of health, chronic diseases, poverty, lack of access to health care and insurance, all can be factors uh, in uh, promoting a bad outcome uh, for patients. Ultimately, of course, we hope that we're gonna achieve herd immunity, uh, but the only way we're probably gonna do that is through a widespread implementation of a vaccine. Uh, there's been over 170 vaccines in development worldwide, which is amazing. Uh, we have 10 vaccines that have been uh, in phase three clinical trials worldwide, which again is also amazing. The goal was to have an FDA approved vaccine within 12 months uh, when we first learned about this virus. That would be January 2021. We are probably going to achieve that, uh, which is amazing. Uh, the last previous record for development of vaccine was the mumps vaccine, which took four years. Okay. Uh, and that was in the mid 1960s. Uh, so very impressive. The US government has invested about nine and a half billion dollars to kind of speed up development and jumpstart manufacturing. Uh, uh, but of course, you have to still prove in these phase three clinical trials that a vaccine can actually work, right? These need to be randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials. You must have a large enough population of patients. We're talking about tens of thousands, 30,000 patients at least. Uh, and patients must be followed for at least two months to make sure that they're not coming down with any infections or complications from the vaccine. And FDA has set a goal of 50% efficacy uh, for vaccines, which I know sounds low, but uh, when you look at influenza vaccine uh, efficacy, uh, it can fluctuate around that mark. Uh, and we know that influenza vaccine, even with 50% efficacy, can be highly effective on a social level at preventing the spread of infection and can prevent a lot of complications of flu. So even if it's only 50% effective at preventing a person from getting the infection, it still can prevent hospitalizations or death as a result of the infection. And it's hoped that a vaccine for COVID would do the same. Now, as of the recording of this lecture, Pfizer has just released a press release saying that their vaccine that they have been developing uh, is showing an efficacy of about 90% which is amazing if that's true. Now we have not actually seen that data to, sh to, to date and there's a lot of uh, details which we don't know about which will be of interest and importance as the FDA begins to kind of look through that data uh, to hopefully give an emergency use authorization in the coming weeks. Moderna is another company which is right behind Pfizer uh, in the United States for development of an FDA approved vaccine. And these are probably the first two companies that are gonna cross the finish line. 
these are mRNA vaccines, which are interesting and novel um, uh, and uh, challenging, uh, at least in how they are stored and how they must be kept uh, because they require very, very cold temperatures, negative 20, negative 70 degrees Celsius. That's not just you know your normal freezer. You've got to have ultra cold temperatures to store these kinds of things. And of course, you have to maintain a cold chain in order to kind of disperse them through a health system or through public health domains out into clinics or vaccination sites where patients can actually receive them. It's also worth noting that both of these vaccines are gonna require a second shot, right? So this isn't just a one and done. This is, here's your shot, come back in three or four weeks so we can give you another one. As the vaccination program ramps up, we're gonna be prioritizing who gets this vaccine uh, in the United States. And it's probably gonna be, of course, essential personnel like healthcare workers, uh, police officers, others who are needed uh, to continue working. Uh, and it's also gonna be, of course, those patient populations which are at risk for the severe outcomes, right? Including people who are 65 years of age and older. As the number of vaccines become more available, we hope to be able to ramp up that uh, to vaccinate more people in uh, various sectors and throughout public, including everybody uh, who could benefit from this vaccine. Um, because again, it's only through regular vaccination that we're probably gonna be able to achieve the herd immunity we ultimately are gonna need. However, as you probably know, vaccines are, have not always been welcomed by the public at large. There is a lot of misinformation about vaccines, their safety and their efficacy out there. Uh, and they've been somewhat politicized uh, in the past or the recent past, which is unfortunate. Uh, and if you survey Americans right now, you will find out that uh, 10 to 11% of them will tell you, I don't even want the COVID vaccine. I don't care how good it is. I don't care what it is. I'm not taking it. And another third of Americans will tell you, eh, I don't know, maybe, but maybe not. Only a little over about half will say, okay, yes. If it's proven to be effective and safe, then sign me up. Um, and so these are some of the barriers that we have uh, to overcome uh, when we think about long-term prevention and dealing with this virus. So with that, I will end things for now. Thank you for your time, your attention. And again, uh, please be safe out there, uh, but more importantly, keep each other safe. Be responsible, wear your masks uh, and maintain your distance. Thank you.